Hello, and welcome to another episode of Shot List, where we talk about how to make a life and a living behind the lens. I'm cinematographer Marshall Chupa, and today I'm speaking with director and producer Mark Milburn. In this episode, Mark and I dive into his unique journey of getting into commercial directing and producing, formerly being an athlete and business owner, how he began to build relationships and find ways of adding value to his clients' lives, the delicate balance of being a director and producer at the same time, and what an OTT platform is and how it could change the game for us creators. Mark is one of those people you meet and know you just want to spend more time around, always having others' best interests at heart and wanting them to succeed just as much as if not more than himself. Whether you're just getting started or a vet in this creative industry, this conversation has some great nuggets and takeaways for your freelance journey. Let's dive in. Thanks so much for coming on the show today, Mark. Appreciate your time. Yeah, dude. Super excited to be here. Rad. Well, I think we connected around eight months ago, following each other on the gram, and um, as we do, it's been fun to learn a little bit about, you know, your your processes. You know, you have the production company, Peeled Media, and getting to know how you roll things. And, you know, it seems like you're diving into the commercial director role. But I'd love to, before we dive into all that, how did things get started with you? I'd love to strip it down to the core. Where did things begin for you way before even, you know, video and photo were a thing? Well, first of all, it's worth noting that I'm pretty sure I followed you first. I'm a huge trendsetter, right? Like I follow you, therefore you follow me back. So the trendsetting aspect. I see. (laughs) (laughs) I have a weird journey as to how I got into this industry, but it all comes back to when I was about 16 through 19, I was lucky and I got into the fashion industry and I got to travel and model and work with some of the best photographers in the world. And, you know, so it'd be like in the summer, I'd go off and do that. In the winter, I'd ski. And so it was a really crazy dichotomy as a child, but it got me into the world of advertising at a young age, and I was obsessed with it. And I knew that I loved advertising, I loved photography. And really, back then, obviously, commercials was only television, like you weren't really seeing social media ads or anything like that. So they were a different journey. Fast forward about 10 years after living in the island and starting some businesses, I knew that I was kind of missing that ad agency world. Like my favorite part about starting my businesses was the marketing and the advertising. I hated running them. So I was like, why don't I see if I can get back into it? And there was an opportunity to move to Vancouver and be a part of a reality show. So I I was like, sweet, this is a crazy opportunity. I get to be a mountain guide on a reality show. Let's go do it. And so I did it and it showed me what the reality world is like, which is mind-blowingly so cool from learning lessons, seeing how like on the, like you want to talk about run and gun, reality show is run and gun, but it's produced run and gun. It's like the neatest thing to be a part of in front of the camera. It's also fascinating to see from behind the camera. And I I fell in love with it. And so as soon as that kind of finished and I had that experience, I ran into my business partner, who's a DP, his name's Mike Decker. He was just starting off doing like, you know, what everybody does in the film industry is they start off with a, Hey, I'll shoot a video for you for five bucks, 500 bucks. And he was doing that. And I was looking at his videos. I'm like, your work's really good, but your clients suck. And I'm like, I have good access to clients, but I don't have a videographer or a cinematographer. So why don't we partner? And that's literally how we started Peeled was we met. And within three weeks, we were on an airplane to Scotland to go shoot a project for what was originally the Vancouver Club out of Vancouver, but turned into being a project for the last Land Rover Defender to come off the production line and got to tour that around Scotland. So it was a really, really fun start. Yeah. How long ago was that that peeled became a thing? We've been trying to figure that out, but according to LinkedIn, six years ago, but it's either five or six years ago. It's a, it's a, I think it's five years ago. Now, when you say you brought, you know, you kind of had the access to clients, like how did that even begin? No, it's a great question. So between being uh, like in the fashion industry when I was younger and going to university and then coming back to this new industry, I was a, I owned three gyms. So I started three fitness businesses and I tried to go to the Olympics for track cycling. And when you own a gym, you meet a lot of people and you build a lot of cool relationships. And it was through that world that I actually would help work with clients outside of the gym and be like, Hey, let's do some marketing stuff. Or I do some, I taught myself how to web design. I taught myself how to do graphic design. And so I would kind of help my clients with their businesses. And so when it came into doing the next step of marketing, that was just video, it was really easy to kind of fall back on. And my clients were like, well, we have businesses and we need things done. So 
I was able to kind of bring from my previous business, those clients who trusted me and saw what I was able to do with that business and bring it to their businesses. And that was kind of the initial start. Now, even to go backwards a little bit more, did you do business school at all? Or like, how did you formulate building gyms? Like that's like a whole process. <laughs> Obviously, you know, that's not, that's, an, uh, that's a skill set. Where did that come from? Like, have you always been interested in business and, and that kind of thing? Or I went, so my degree is in the human dimensions of climate change. So I literally graduated with a 50.20 degree. I like didn't care about school. I knew at the age of 13 that I wanted to own a gym. I knew what it was going to be called, what the colors were, what the layout was going to be. Like I just knew from a kid how much fitness meant to me. And when I finished modeling, I had some money. So I put that into building out my first gym. And it was a dream. Like I look back out on it now and I'm like, I had the most amazing nine years of what I thought was stressful, which has no relationship to my life and career now. So it was like right. my career back then was so healthy and wholesome. But what was really cool, like going back to the school question was like, no, I, did, I studied some things to do with business, but I spent more time at university studying what I, I graduated from 20 different faculties. So I was obsessed with just learning. And I think that's, that's what it's been for me in my life is hate school, love learning. Interesting. Where would you mark that transition point of being able to go full time as a creative, I guess, because you you know, you have the sports background and the gym, like, I guess there's like a tipping point for a lot of people on in their journey, like trying to figure out where that is. Was there a certain opportunity that you're given that, that launched that? Like, where was that point for you? So after Rio, I missed Rio, which was my Olympic cycle I was going for. It was kind of then, and I was just like, you know what? Victoria has been an epic place for me to live and grow and build a family. And when I don't have kids or a wife, but it was just like a family of friends. And I just knew I needed more. Like I lived in New York and Singapore and Miami and Milan. So like to go from a mega cities like that, like epicenters of creativity, arts, culture to Victoria, it's like something's missing. And so the move was very simple to Vancouver to transition out of one career into the other. I started like many did, which is like that tiptoe approach. But I realized very quickly that you just have to kind of do it. You know what I mean? Like Everyone goes off, oh, I just do a little bit, but like honestly, where your energy goes, it grows. And it, I turned around and I sold the gyms in pretty much a week. And I, I met Mike and we literally rented a studio and we came up with a brand name and we incorporated and we had a company. And I went from earning ten to $15,000 a month, working five hours a day, five days a week to earning $3,500 a month if I was lucky. And I did that for three years as up and coming director producer. <laughs> so it was in a city where my rent was over 100% of my income. So why did you do that? Does it come down to passion? Like where was the transition? You said you love the gym, the fitness stuff. Like why would you give up a high income flowing lifestyle to take a step back and start a production company and you know start from scratch again? Because life is short. And I was looking around at all my friends and their lives and they were you know having getting married and having kids and i was looking at my life and going i haven't accomplished or experienced what i want to accomplish or experience yet i haven't created anything that i look at that i'm super proud of i grew up an only child in the country my greatest asset was my imagination and as great as it is to have a nine to five i felt like i wasn't using my greatest asset and so i think the transition couldn't have been easier for me because I just knew I wasn't doing what would, like, I had done what I was meant to do. I knew at 13, own the gyms, I did it. Now, looking back, I could have done it a way different way and made way more money and had a really great life. <laughs> but right. like, I regret nothing. And I'm so grateful for that 10 year journey that I had that set me up for doing what I do now, which carries so many of those traits from that previous world into it. And so what is it that you were really drawn to in this industry? Is it directing specifically and the business side comes along with it as the producing and the production company and all that? Or what really drives you in this world? I think what had drove me from the beginning has shifted slightly now. But what drove me in the beginning was obviously the creative aspect. And I just didn't realize when I got into it, I wanted to create these stories, right? You see everyone I think has this where they're like, oh, I have a great idea for a commercial. Oh, I have a great idea for a film. And then what you don't realize though is all commercials and all film and all plays are steeped in strategy and they're steeped in user journey and they're steeped in messaging. So you get into it almost naively. And I didn't want to go through the advertising agency route where I started off as a minion. I wanted to be behind the camera 
which I thought was the way that you create ideas. What you, you realize real quickly that the director doesn't create the idea. The ad agency creates the idea. Your job is just to put it into a camera. <laughs> right. And so we ended up actually approaching it really differently is that I actually get hired almost 100% of the time to do the strategy and to write the ad or the campaign that we're shooting. And that makes us kind of a unique entity where that doesn't actually happen that often, where, hey, we need you guys to come up with a way to get this product, this user journey to our consumer. How would you do it? And it's kind of created a niche for us with our clientele and with the businesses that we get to work with, where I think I told you this the other day, but I don't think I've ever had a project where my client comes to set because they don't care because they're like, you've created the story, you've created the version. And if it flops on the media buying side, you're fired. <laughs> so it's not right. <laughs> so it's an interesting experience, but I would say that was kind of like the, the pull to get into it. So yeah, just creativity in general, being able to be creative. And that's one thing I've noticed getting to know you the last little while is that you really care about the end use of the product. I think a lot of creatives perhaps go into this just, you know, uh, you know, as a cinematographer, I want to make sure this looks incredible and the lights beautiful and all that kind of jazz. Whereas like, I feel like when I talk to you, you're just like, that is great. But if there's no end in mind or the reason for the purpose of the spot or what impact are we making or what is, you know, all those sorts of things, like you don't even want to do it. <laughs> is that <laughs> correct? Or how do, how do you approach that mindset? It's funny. Like, I think it comes from the fact that when I was a small business owner, still am, but like when I was like the gym, not in the creative side, every dollar mattered that much more. Like it was so hard to make money. And so every dollar that was spent, I wanted it to have impact. And I think I carried that forward into this side of the career where like when a company is spending money, they all started off small at one point with an idea to get big. So regardless if they're big now, I still want the commercial to have an impact. It also goes on the other side. Our time, your and my time to watch television or to be, to be on social media is limited. So why put a shitty ad in front of me and waste my time? If you're going to advertise, it's your responsibility to educate and entertain me. Don't bore me with your shitty advertising in hopes that I'm going to buy your stuff. Educate me and entertain me. So yeah, right. I think that there's a dual responsibility, which we lost because advertising took so many new forms with this massive wave of social media that we've lost that idea. And it's now time for that to turn around and come back. So I think that's why I'm insanely passionate about the strategy of what's created and also the ethos that's behind what's being created. And I've noticed your content as a director kind of leans in the humor category or like, <laughs> I guess that's part of it, right? You're trying to get away from boring ads and just making them entertaining and connect to help connect to people. Is that, is that right? I think so. I mean, life's tough. So nothing feels better than a little giggle or laugh. But also if I ask most people, like, tell me a commercial you remember, somebody will inevitably say they remember a, a comedic commercial. If you can make somebody feel something, either comedically or romantically or through your sadness, then your commercial, it's like, is going to probably be a success. It will have, it will have an effect. I mean, it's funny. I only direct, like I'd say 90% of the work I direct is comedic and commercial, yet in film, everything I ever propose or do is super dark and sad and horrible. <laughs> and so it's like, <laughs> like the medium seems to change the messaging. So when it comes to the process, okay, you have a client and you want to make an impact, you know, with their dollars spent as a director, or as a producer, or someone who comes up with these concepts and strategy, what is your process like? I think it's worth noting like that I'm kind of also at a turning point where in order for my career, I have to choose one or the other, which is be a producer, be a director especially in the commercial world. And the reason I bring this up or before I answer your question is the fact that a producer brain will trump a creative, a director brain or a director brain will trump a, a producer brain. And what I mean by that is a producer brain's focus is the bottom line. A director's brain's focus is the creative line. And they're at the opposite end of the spectrum in most cases. They're rarely aligned. And so in that situation, it's imperative that you kind of choose one or the other because it's one will limit the other. <laughs> and the one that's often doing the limiting is the producer. <laughs> and so my process for most of the time, because it's if I'm hired through Peeled and it's from the strategic creative side, is from the producing side. And that is helping write a commercial that gets the message across, really understand the mediums that they're going to put the commercial out on. So I'd be working with the client and their media buyers to be like, how are you doing this? 
Where are they being used? What platforms are they being used on? What's the length of the commercial that we're cutting? How many micro cuts are we doing? Is it male or female focused? Who is like really understanding how the media buying team and the ad placement team is going to use what's being created. And then I will reverse engineer the writing into the larger piece so that I can create micro segments out of a full commercial. We know that the full commercial, the 30, the 45, the 60, even maybe a 15, will rarely ever be watched zero to 100%. But the zero to sixes, the zero to tens, you'll probably get a viewer's attention. And so it's really important, in my opinion, to, to focus on your micro edits that will lead up to your macro edit, which is your full, and understand where they're being used. And so that's in my initial stages before I even start getting to costing. And then once we know that, we can start really nailing, like dialing in the brief and the production costs and the teams that we need, which is all industry standard kind of thing. Yeah, interesting. I can totally see how, I mean, having to play both roles is definitely contradictive. Like a producer <laughs> and director, like usually they're the ones fighting on set for different reasons against each other. So if you have to do fight yourself, that's got to be complicated at some point. <laughs> so Very much so. It's true because look at your career and probably anybody you talk to is like a director's greatest limitation or the easiest limitation for a director is financial. So anything is possible if you have money. And when it comes to the creative side of things, because if you can't do it in camera, you can do it in post if you have the money. And so if you're creating your creative brief based off of your limitations, which is your producer's brain putting the limitations on there, your creative brief will stay within the confines of those limitations, aka it'll be a pretty boring commercial. You're going to limit your camera movements. You're going to limit your cuts. You're going to limit your, in one sense, you're going to rely a little bit more heavier on the writing. And you're going to lie a little bit heavier on the acting, which isn't a negative, but it is just changing you, your creative style. And inevitably, if you're going to get a you know production off the ground, like building a team around what you do is important. How do you go about finding the right team members or the crew or for the whole process? Because inevitably, it could be something small or something big. How do you scale? When do you scale? How do you find people? Awesome question. I mean... People are everything in this business, and I'm sure you've heard that from other guests, and you'll hear that for other guests. And if somebody says that's not true, then that person's so wrong. <laughs> they're lying. Yeah, they're full of shit. People are everything in this business, and my rule has always been it's not about what you pay your people. It's how you respect them, how you feed them, and what type of coffee you give them. <laughs> I like that. And because I learned something when I did a sci-fi pilot a couple of years ago, and that was everybody wants to work on these freaking pilots, these, these, like, these ideas, these microfilms, and they'll work 12, 14, 16 hours for like a hundred dollars. But you turn around, you're going, I'm going to shoot a commercial. They're like, I want $700. And you're like, <laughs> you're going to get paid in chips and coffee, but everybody wants to be a part of something. And so what I realized, like if I go into the commercial world, if I just treat people with good food, order specifically what they want, if we don't have crafty or really focus on getting them a latte from their favorite places, instead of just a shitty cup of coffee from a, an espresso machine, people start to feel really like they belong and that they're valued. And the second that happens, it's crazy the amount of jobs we've had last minute where I call someone and they're like, I'm on a union job, but hold on, I'll get it covered. I'll be on your set. And you're like, wow, this is pretty cool. They don't ask us, what's the rate? They don't really care. They care more about being a part of a team where nobody's wrong, everybody's right. Let's drink good coffee and get this thing done. Yeah, so that really speaks to putting the people first and really respecting the people. It comes down to people. Uh, which is, I mean, kind of brings me to another question is, or I guess it's an answer to the question is like, what are some other important skills that are outside of being, a, let's say you want to be a director or cinematographer, whatever it is, what are some important skills that you need in order to be successful in this industry that are not obvious? Let's break that up into two categories. If you want to be successful as a producer, and if you want to be successful as a director, because it's hard to be successful at both, because you're going to run into the previous dimension conflict. To be successful as a producer, in my opinion, it's about, again, my strategy is focus on what the client's needs are long-term versus the short-term win. We've been in business for what, five to six years where there's two of us that run our company and we do just shy of two to 2.5 million a year in revenue. And that's in projects. Our projects aren't 300, $500,000. They're the 60 to 100 range. But the 60 to 100 range is consistently the same group of clients who give us creative control. And our profit margins on the 60 to 100s 
are 40 to 60%. Whereas if on the 300,000, you're lucky if you're getting a profit margin of 20%. When you have a $300,000 commercial, your chances are that you have way more crew, way more logistics, way more post-production, and our all-time favorite, way more client and agency on your set. And the second that those bastards end up on your set, <laughs> and I mean that lovingly, costs go up, efficiency goes down. You know, a brief should be really freaking good. And so a producer's job is to get really defined briefs, is to really focus on building the trust with their clientele. It's really about building a team that's going to work for you efficiently. It's not about ego. It's about the end product. And it's about building the relationship really long term. Don't focus on this project. You don't know where your client's career, like company is going to go. They could just erupt. And now all of a sudden you're working with a unicorn, a couple billion dollar company, and they're spending half a million to a million dollars a year with you. And you're doing some great commercials and some Christmas parties, but you don't care because your production company has consistent revenue and you're able to employ lots of really great people. So what I'm hearing is bigger isn't necessarily better. And there might be a sweet spot when it comes to like generating revenue uh, and keeping crew sizes down, but still producing a good quality product. Is that what I'm hearing? A hundred percent. I think there's something that needs to be heavily addressed in this industry, which is before 20 years ago, how many platforms were there for video advertising? You had movie theaters, you had television, you had radio advertising, and you had print. Look how many platforms there are now. Look how many streaming channels, networks, television things, mobile devices, everything's different, which means the advertising budgets haven't gone up, but the amount of advertising that needs to be created for the multiple amount of platforms that exist has gone up. So now those million dollar commercials are far and few between. Somebody's going to, instead of doing $1 million commercial, they're going to do 10 $100,000 commercials because now they have to advertise on a hundred different platforms. So the thing is that we don't think about on the production side is our production side dollar value has gone down, but the post-production advertising side has quadrupled or 10 times because now you're advertising on so many more platforms. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, moving forward, I don't think it's going to slow down in that direction <laughs> at all. No. And to think a little bit about how are you building relationships with clients in the first place? Because I think that's a lot of a question that a lot of people getting into this don't quite understand. Like you said, you had the luxury of, I guess, building a lot of relationships inside of when you're doing the gym stuff that translated over into video production land. How do you begin to build relationships? Maybe if it's like a cold situation or like how, how do you search? Do you only go off of warm referrals? Like how do you begin to find new clients? I think a lot of them have come from very similar to our relationship where if you can provide value to someone else, someone will provide value to you. And the more people that you're able to connect and network with, the more your clients coming back, like well, people will refer to you. So some of our big biotech companies came to us because we worked years and years ago when we started, we shot a Christmas events for their advertising agency and they just needed somebody. And we met at a networking event. And so from her, she, her agency blew up. We ended up with all of her biotech clients because we're not going a, a production company to advertising agency. That really kind of makes it like we are the ones building the relationships with the company, not the agency. And so we don't have to go through as much of the rigmarole that if you were a production company trying to build a relationship with an agency that you do, where an agency is going to go out to tender and it's going to go up for an RFP and it's going to go for, you know, because an agency has got to try and make its money. The production company has to try and make its money. We don't have that. Now, with that being said, when you don't have the agency, you also take on the burden of the creative process. And so Sometimes the agency is great because they're the ones sorting out all those hard questions of where's the ad going to be used, how's it going to be used, who's going to be in it. And they're the, taking the burden of the creative and your job is just to produce. So it's a sacrifice, right? So with regards to getting clients, I mean, provide value to all of those around you. The amount of photographers, like I think one of the photographers we worked with last year, we easily brought in $100,000 worth of them and it was a side project for him. But it was just, we had him on every single project. Well, he turned around and relayed us about a half a million dollars worth of work in production. It's kind of an interesting thing where if you can provide value to someone, whether it's a connection or whether it's an introduction, it's, it's going to go 10 times further than sitting there building a really nice website and a great reel and hope that somebody spends the time to look at it, watch it and read it. Yeah, 100%. Adding value is number one, doesn't matter. And inevitably, if you're call that karma credit or whatever you want, 
the snowball, in my experience, begins to roll. And I think at the beginning, it is hard to understand how to begin to build relationships, but it's almost like one thing, you do one thing that turns into the next, turns into the next. So it's easy to look back. And I guess even myself, I ask myself, how the heck did all, <laughs> how the heck am I making a full-time living for the last five plus years doing this? And um, yeah, obviously it started with one person doing a good job, them seeing it, probably a warm referral, and then it continues on from there. Is that kind of how you see it? A hundred percent. And I mean, again, it's, it comes down to your business model. You know, for my business model is interesting. If my clients allow me to have creative freedom, then why do I need to hunt for new clients in search of creative freedom? Like if somebody is going to say, I'll pay you 500 or I'm going to give you a budget of $500,000 to do this commercial, but you have to do it exactly as this creative board is, or somebody's going to say, I'm going to give you $100,000, but you have cre total creative freedom to come up with the idea, work with our marketing team and completely design it. You and I both know I'm going to lean towards the $100,000 commercial because creative freedom is weighted more for me. But $500,000 commercials, according to boards, that agency may have written something really cool with really visual, cool visual effects and really interesting on the day production value that will elevate your skill set, but you've had no creative freedom. So you're a service provider, but you're going to learn something new and experience something new. So again, it's, it's that trade-off in your career, whether you're a producer, whether you're a director, whether you're a freaking DP, it doesn't matter. Like you're constantly trading off that fight between creative freedom and learning through being a service provider. It's that's the biggest trade off. So it's kind of like time, money or creative. And I guess it's a balancing act between them, depending on the, the project. And I guess you have to weigh that against each other. A hundred percent. And of course, you're going to find like Johnny Mass, who's getting good budgets and total creative freedom. But that's because he's known for his style. And if you can be one of those create like, I would say in Vancouver, there's only so many of us that focus in the commercial world on writing and directing comedic pieces. Like there's definitely more guys focusing on really quick cut, really like beautiful cinematography. Like give me a bright room and a good actor and I'll write you a hell of a commercial. <laughs> and, and I love that stuff because I love what actors bring to the table from a directing perspective. I like the fact that as humans, I would rather watch somebody perform. Whereas if I'm watching these massive quick cuts, there's some like, you know, so many quick cuts with amazing cinematography. It's like, great, but I'm not getting enough time to enjoy the cinematography because there's so many quick cuts and you're just trying to stimulate a part of my brain to try and hopefully get a message across so that I click and then eventually I invest in the brand instead of actually letting me build a relationship with the actor who's actually speaking on your behalf. Yeah, I guess that speaks to your approach and as a director, as a creative, like where you're most passionate about. So it's cool to hear that is kind of what fires you up outside of, you know, and I think that's great because it separates you from others when it comes to a specific role. I'm curious when it comes to, you know, being a freelancer, it's always a roller coaster. Sometimes things are booming and the other times it's crickets. How have you dealt with that in your journey? And I think one thing specifically I've heard you mention to me is just like how retainers with clients have helped break through those moments, but maybe before you even got there, how has that been? How have you found ways around it? That kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, retainers have a positive and a negative. A retainer is great because it gives you a monthly stipend that you know that even if you're quiet, you have your income coming in. But at the end of the day, it's also a burden because it means that every month you're having to commit a certain period of time or creative energy or even over like thought process to something that you don't necessarily want to at that point in time. So say a big project comes in, you still have to put your time and energy into that client. It's a bit of a handcuff. With regards to balancing it out, I mean, I don't recommend my approach to people because my approach is burdensome, which is when it's quiet, do anything to make your money. I should have probably taken my other advice, which would be focus on your, put 100% into what it is you want to be and do, which is what you're doing right now. And you're seeing that growth, right? I taught myself how to code websites. I taught myself how to do branding guidelines. I taught myself how to do graphic design. I taught myself how to do strategy. I've studied hours and hours and hours of media buying and, and SEO so that I could speak product. And it's great because it increases my value and it increases the group that I speak to. AKA, I don't just speak to the CMOs and the marketing directors. I, I talk to head of product and head of engineering to understand what it is they want me to communicate through advertising. But the burden is, is it takes away from your focus of developing your creative mindset. And the more time you have behind your camera, 
touching your camera, using your camera, the better you get with it. The more time you have with your lights, the better you are with it. So my philosophy is in your downtime, shoot. If you're in your downtime, right. Like downtime is the greatest asset and downtime doesn't last forever. Downtime only lasts for the time that downtime is around, but it's not forever. And the more, if you take that time and invest in practicing, shooting, doing skills, if you got some cash, write a spec ad and do it. My God, the second you're done your spec ad, you'll be busy again and you'll wish that you could go back and do another spec ad, but you'll never get to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so true. It's so true. I don't know what it is, but it's sometimes when it rains, it pours and gets quiet and quiet. And it's like a mental game where it's like, oh my God, like I was so busy for like all these months and all of a sudden it's like a month of quiet and as you start to doubt your choices and your career path and Jesus Christ, am I good enough and all these sorts of things, you know, and I think it's just really important to know that if you can put your energy in the right places and I think especially with the spec, I really like that you mentioned that because ultimately if you're creating work, especially that you love and you're showing it to the right people, again, that's showing it in the right ways too. Inevitably, people are going to get to know you for that kind of work and come to you for that type of work. So, yep. Honestly, I commend every actor, DP, director, producer around here that's doing these indie shorts and building teams and challenging themselves. Like, do you need to go to film school to be in film? Absolutely not. Do you need to be an epic DP to be an epic DP? Absolutely not. Like, it's if you're just present and constantly just working, you will be busy because this industry is such a weird industry where if you see, I'm sure it's happened to you where you look on Instagram and you look at these guys and you're like, I'm way better than them. And then they're always working. You're like, I don't get it. Well, it's because they're always working. They don't put out how much money they're making, but they're always on set. I mean, I will always, I'll commend Mike, my business partner. Mike has no ego. He will go DP big production and the next day he'll go be a swing and a grip on somebody else's project and he does it because he just wants to be on set and the more he's on set the more he's in demand this industry is really easy to be busy now being busy and doing what you love are different things <laughs> yeah i think it's a fine balance between you know you gotta ask yourself if you're staying busy but like you're making yogurt commercials and really you want to be shooting car commercials at the end of the day you're not building the portfolio you need to reach that clientele or to get on that director or agency's mind in the right way. I think so. It's really important to, at least I really believe in spec and doing things that you love, because if not, where are you going? <laughs> you know, you, you, your career will shape it for you. You don't get to shape your career, I think. It's funny you say that, right? Like, I mean, if you look at my portfolio and the clients I work with, I've worked in mortgage, mortgage software, financial technologies. I've worked in ransomware. I've worked in HR management. I've done like two car spots and I've done a bunch of biotech and some other shit in there. The funnest stuff I do is the stuff no one wants to do. You know why? Because I get creative freedom. <laughs> when you get into the car industry, say goodbye to your creative freedom because you're shooting to agency. You're shooting to company to agency, agency to North American agency, North American agency to their production company, production company to the local production company, local production company to the ground. When you work in mortgage software, your job is to talk to 18,000 mortgage brokers. Have fun figuring out how to do it. And guess what? <laughs> one probably pays you better than the other, and I'll bet you it's the mortgage software one. Yeah, I'd say so too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when there's that many layers of the cake to be baked, you're only able to respond to the bottom end of that like six-layer car commercial. Yeah, it can only go so far. So I think pros and cons to that whole process. And I think you've kind of found maybe a unique spot where in the market where, I mean, I'll give you credit. You also are lucky enough to have the brain that can handle the producing and the directing. And like, you've been interested to learn about all the, the marketing and the ad buying and, you know, how people respond. And I don't know that everyone's got that in them. So respect to you, Mark, you know, <laughs> you're Appreciate definitely, it. definitely uh, a unique one in that, in that I think that's freaking awesome. And I wish I had a little bit more of that in me. But um, I think that's it's also an interesting one is like the left brain, right brain thing. Like that is, again, producer, director, that's the collision of creative versus the spreadsheet. And so it is, it's rad that you can have both. It's such a cool experience. I think every director should produce. I think every producer should direct. I don't think you should be both roles because a director needs to understand why a producer thinks the way they do. And a producer needs to learn what the creative freedom is that a director needs in order to thrive, in order to bring special sauce to a commercial. Both benefit 
the ad agency. And at the end of the day, if they are working aligned, they're both going to benefit the end client. Our job is to be the voice of the client. And unfortunately, sometimes the agency is right in the way they do that. And sometimes the agency is wrong in the way they do that. But our responsibility is technically up the ladder to the small business or the business that is paying for this ad to be made. And it's tough because, man, how often do you want to go out and shoot some crazy, like, epic military thing in the middle of nowhere that's like so visually cool and you're like these epic shots at sunrises with and then you're like but wait what's the product that i'm selling oh right a uh, running watch for apple where it's just a guy just you know going for a walk and so it's there is this huge like super hard balance act that exists within our industry but i think everyone should do that role once on a project so they gain the respect I think Mike said, he's like, you want to be a DP, learn how to grip. If you want to be a grip, learn how to DP. If you want to like speak, learn to speak each other's languages on sets, experience what it's like to live a day in those shoes and you'll have a better set. Yeah, I hundred percent agree with that. And, uh, this just comes down to like, even just understanding the editing process. If you're a shooter, like understanding the coverage you need to get the wide, medium, tight or whatever it is that the editor has something to chew on. Like those are such important you know, not that to say you should live there and stay there, because that's definitely the way I'm moving away from is focusing on what I'm good at and outsourcing the rest. I think there's something to be said for that. But coming, at least having the knowledge and coming from there, I think is such an important part of it. Oh, dude, I, can, I completely agree. Completely agree. So I wanted to sway the conversation a little bit. And this is in an interesting direction. I think you and I stumbled upon this conversation recently. And I think it'd be interesting for our viewers or our listeners to to hear, and that's specifically talking about OTT platforms, which stands for over the table. I honestly didn't know what the heck that was until you mentioned it to me. And I'd love to dive into, I think it has potential to be a bit of a game changer and, you know, change the way creators think and are acting. So tell me a little bit what that is. And what, yeah, let's just dive into it. So just to clarify, OTT stands for over the top. Not over the table. Over the top. Over the top, Sorry. yeah. My bad. That's why I should not talk about it. <laughs> you should. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So an over the top media service is essentially just like, it'd be as if you had your own Netflix, you controlled your advertising, your content, and you had subscribers. So we stumbled into creating an OTT. When COVID hit, I partnered with two guys, ironically, in the fitness industry, and we created an app called the Movement App. And it was an OTT platform where you could log in every day and have a virtual training or a lot, join like a group for a live workout. But then that workout would be uploaded to the platform and you could every day stream those workouts. We owned the platform, but we also controlled all the advertising on the platform, all the pre-roll, the post-roll. We, we owned the image, the brand, we owned everything. And what's so, so, so cool and exciting about that is you're now able to really create niche marketplaces where you can control your niche. And there's something to be said, you can either own 1% of 100, or you can own 100% of 1%. And that's where OTTs come in. Better way to describe it is like this. Yes, YouTube exists, where you can have your own channel, but you aren't able to dictate the advertising on your channel. You also don't get a lot of your user data. In OTTs, you can create your own channel with your own content, but you can also add your own advertising in the front, add your own advertising in the back, break it up how you want, but you also own all your client data. And you're able to take that data and build out micro subscription networks or who knows, like anything. And so in my opinion, it's the direction where a lot of short form and uh, reality and niche reality are going to go. And Again, it's another opportunity for advertising to blow up because now people are going to be hiring more people to create advertising for their own networks. I think we spoke about it because you have a friend in Equestrian, but an example would be, you know, she creates her own Equestrian OTT and people are able to log in to like go to their website, which is that OTT. And she has now sold the advertising, but she dictates what the advertising looks like. So if you're advertising Equestrian, do you really need to advertise soccer? No. Because your audience is there for equestrian. So keep it all equestrian focused. Advertise only equestrian products. And then dictate how the advertising looks so that you can be like, you know what? I really like the way that your ad is. It really talks towards my theme. And it's fairly women focused. Perfect. Instead of it, maybe you, your platform isn't male focused. So you don't really want males in the advertising. And that's, that's up to you. That's fine. There's not a negative or a positive. It's just you now have that control, which is what an OTT gives you. I think the interesting part that intrigued me when you mentioned it was just the 
I don't know, let's just put it into perspective. The project we've talked about before together is like shooting a bull riding or following like a documentary style, that kind of thing on an athlete or whatever it may be. But then being able to start to develop a bunch of like cool short pieces. Okay, you got a bull rider, you got a fly fisher, you got a whoever it is. And then you start to build that catalog and create your own quote unquote channel that's built on your own platform that then gives you the creative ability to just as soon as you prove concept and start to create viewership, people start to follow you and pay for a subscription because they care about the content you're making. You're getting creative control because it's your platform that then allows you to then people come to you to pay you for the advertising versus the other way around. Is that kind of how it could work? Exactly. So it empowers the creators. I think the part that really intrigued me. Huge, huge. Absolutely. You can now make multiple revenue streams of your production. I saw an ad, I think you sent it to me, or somebody was like, oh, we created the first OTT for film. And I was like, that's total bullshit because you haven't. But <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> you know, if you're in, you could create your own indie network and you can let people, you could charge people to put their indie stuff on your platform, which you can't do, you could do on YouTube, but it'd be weird. You can then choose the ads that you want to run in front of them. You can then have people subscribe to it. You can pay it as a single purchase or a multi, like it's, and then again, from a production standpoint, the amount of content that is required for a, a general network, you can imagine how much is required for a micro network like this. And so is advertising, is marketing going away? Hell no. It's just getting more and more and more platforms, but we're just getting more and more niche platforms with the ability to really talk to the consumers we want to talk to. And it interests me in the way that like you can subscribe, I guess, just as the way you subscribe on YouTube to you know specific channels that you like, but it gets even more niche where I guess... Correct me if I'm wrong, but OTT, you you kind of become your own network. So therefore, wherever you're on your cell phone, your TV or whatever, that you can just tap into that specific channel. And, you know, let's say you got a channel going on all these different things that I'm interested in. Like you don't get fed all that other stuff like nope. YouTube, you're going on there and it's feeding you all different ads, feeding you all different other videos you should click on. It's just like, no, you're just in the thing that you know you want to be in. Exactly. It's the most captive of the niche content creation you could possibly have. It's so cool. Yeah, it's super cool. And do you see yourself diving into those realms in the future? Or? I do. So I think I told you, but I took a contract with a tech startup because, you know, it's been an amazing five years with Peeled and I need to take a step away from producing a bit. So I'm hopefully looking to hang my directing shingle somewhere else and, and let focus more on the directing side. But I took a product management position with a tech startup, which is ironically, product management and producing are almost the same thing. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm helping develop an app and with these guys and in, in the fashion industry. And so, but a big part of the future marketing plan is to develop an OTT for them where we have our own A to Z network that we own. And that would include all the advertising. Therefore, my film arm and production and directing arm would be able to come in and, and develop content for it. Yeah, very cool. It's, uh, it makes sense kind of how you can transition your skill set from the past into that, into the future. So excited to see where you might take that. Yeah, me too. It's funny. I think I told you, it's like my goal is I want to do a film, but I want to own the creative idea. I don't want to be at the mercy of production and management and money. So it's my goal is to save up the money and just be able to do my film the way I want to do it and not be, if if it gets distributed, great. And if not, who cares? I mean, I just think there's so much beauty in the making of a film and the fun aspect of putting it together that it would be a shame to, to create and create something that you don't have the ultimate control over and you're at the mercy of having to fit into a mold. So all of this is kind of on that end goal of eventually creating a film or a series or a project where I'm able to self-fund it and build the team I want and, and have a project where everybody gets to come together and, and be passionate about the end, end result. Yeah, I mean, that, that also speaks to like the cleverness, not cleverness, maybe the wrong word, but in the industry, realizing that, you know, creating different avenues of revenue stream become important. Like that's one thing I've learned, at least is as a commercial cinematographer, that is not my only form of revenue stream. And therefore there needs to be backups when that will inevitably slow down or go away. And the fact that you can lean on your tech background and moving into that, that then fuels the fire and you have enough extra cash to push into the passion project. I think that's maybe an important thing to note for the younger people getting into this is try to find other sources of revenue, revenue streams that, yeah, they might be 
specific to exactly what you're doing, but they give you the ability to create and have the freedom of time and, and resources to create what you want, which is sounds like for you, that's this is film. Yeah, I think it will be. I mean, I think film will be the medium for storytelling that I'll be able to look back at later on in my life and be really proud of the story that was told. Commercial for me is about making people feel a certain way in hopes of supporting the end goal, which is helping the business grow and succeed. So moving forward, what uh, what's firing you up right now in regards to projects moving forward, pushing the director's role? What's the future look like for you? Honestly, with directing, I've got one more commercial next week. That one's going to be really tough. I'm excited about it. It's for a company called Lorex and they're really fun. Like it's, it's fun because it's shooting from, we shoot the camera and then we shoot from the camera's camera perspective because they're a camera company. So it's, it's really fun from a thinking perspective, how you're going to do it. And this company is kind of burgeoning from being kind of an old school marketing model to trying to get more creative and build personality into their advertising. So it's a slower movement, but it's happening, which is exciting. That's on the horizon. And then honestly, for next year, I, I haven't locked in anything big and exciting yet, but I'm excited for what next year will bring with it with regards to, you know, spending less time on the producing side and focusing more on being a director and being able to sit in that role, maybe a little bit heavier than I have been where I'm having to play both roles. So, but chances are I'll probably just get sucked right back into producing. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a gift and a curse uh, to have the multiple skill set. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's fun. It's fun, you know? So, yeah. And as we come to wrap things up here in the conversation, do you have any advice or things you could wish you could tell your younger self when starting out or getting into this that come to mind on the journey you've taken? The amount of creatives that I meet that don't believe in themselves drives me nuts. And you've been there, but. Sometimes, oh, I don't have the great gear or I don't have the right money or I'm not good enough or this guy's better. It's like, honestly, it's like if you don't believe in yourself and just do it, you're going to regret it so much later in your life. And and I have a buddy who's a colorist who I just turned around. And I said, you're good. I keep hiring you. Make a page. And now he's booked with like four of the top directors around. And it was just because <laughs> he finally put himself out there because I made him. And it's my greatest advice I learned from a reality show I was on, which is that People are too busy to hate you. People are too busy to take the time to mock you and to judge you. They'll judge you in a second and then they'll move on because their lives are busy. And that was the biggest thing I learned is like, unless you take risks, you're always just going to be in the shadows. And so take those risks, trust your creative outlet, be bold and have fun with this amazing job we get to have in the creative world, which is to be creative because you could turn around and be an accountant. And your whole life is you, computers, and numbers. And if that's what you want, then kudos to you. But that's that's not what I think most people want. So, Yeah, that's a really good point. And really, I think, hits home probably, I'm sure, for a lot of people. I don't know what it is, the self-confidence thing. And uh, it's been like a really big key to kind of getting to where I have been myself is just refusing to give up, essentially. Just saying, you know, from the beginning, like I knew I wanted to be behind the camera, whether that was stills or video. And there's just this fire that, you know, I've had definitely had a lot of different jobs before getting into this and pushing through knowing that, oh, this is a temporary thing that gets me to my goal. So I think, yeah, again, I will echo the believing in yourself part is, is so important because eventually, if you focus that time and energy in the right places, it will happen. It will work. And I can even think back remembering, I think I reached out to some photographer way when I was starting on maybe this is like a decade ago and just like how did you get to where you're going like I was asking those questions and you know his answer was patience basically he told me give it five years of like good hard work and then you'll it'll start to work and I just remember thinking damn it like five years that's a, that's a long time like I want to be there right now and so I think yeah patience and believing yourself are super important <laughs> Very, very, very true. And I mean, dude, you're you're an example of it. Like your path and journey is only going to keep growing. And I mean, the way you think about business and doing a podcast is a great example. Like, yeah, car podcasts are arduous. They're work. But man, I, I did a podcast. I started it five years ago. I did three episodes. It stimulated a business idea and I started Peeled. <laughs> so like, <laughs> like it took three episodes and I was like, you're right, I'm just going to do Peeled. And so like the podcast died after three episodes, but it was the fact that I took that risk and it stimulated something. And like all of a sudden, I'm in the career and the life I have now. That's amazing. Where can people go to find your work? Like who you are, what you're about? 
I'm so bad at posting my work, which is <laughs> I, a good thing. In the adage, the big, greatest ad agencies in the world have the worst advertising websites. Classic. Yeah. Well, I would say go to. Uh, I think I gotta remember what our email is. I think it's peeledmedia.com because <laughs> our Instagram is get peeled. But um, yeah, peeledmedia.com shows a lot of our work, and it's it is updated every so often, or our Vimeo, or if you're searching weird industries, we probably did something in them. So <laughs> on Instagram, it's at peeled or get peeled. On Instagram, it's get peeled, and then mine's works by Mark W R K S. Yeah, that's your personal. Awesome. Sweet. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today, Mark. That was a fun conversation. I think there's definitely some valuable nuggets in there. And um, yeah, hope it's helpful for the world. Dude, thank you for having me. And uh, can't wait to work together soon. Yeah, likewise. Okay, that was director and producer Mark Milburn. Mark is such a rad human. And I'm glad we had a chance to unpack how he's been able to make a life and a living behind the lens. If you want to check out more of Mark's work, you can head over to peeledmedia.com or check out his personal Instagram, Works by Mark. In future episodes, I'll be speaking with photographers, cinematographers, directors, producers, reps, and anyone who has decided to take this ambitious leap of faith at making a life and a living behind the lens. Stay tuned and subscribe to the channel on your favorite podcast app. And if you like what you hear, leave me a star rating or review, or simply share this episode with a friend you think it might help. Also, feel free to leave me a DM on Instagram at Marshall Chupa, and let me know you've heard something of value. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time on shot list.